to Psalm 23. I want to give our attention this morning to a psalm that I suspect is very familiar to you because it reminds us that the godly man or woman has a shepherd. A shepherd who knows, knows you, loves you, cares for you, leads you, and a shepherd that's going to ultimately welcome you home. David writes Psalm 23, and he teaches us in this psalm about God by calling him a shepherd, and it is a psalm that is just rich with doctrine, as we'll see. The providence of God is here, the sovereignty of God is here, that he's all-knowing, that he's omniscient, that he's all-powerful, that he's omnipotent, that he's merciful, loving, gracious, compassionate. Salvation is in the psalm. I want us to see the shepherd this morning from Psalm 23. David writes, this is a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where is it that you first heard those words? I wonder where you first heard Psalm 23. And as a result of where you've heard Psalm 23, I wonder how it makes you think about Psalm 23 as you sat here this morning and you hear those familiar words once again. It's been cited by presidents and prime ministers and kings Prince of Preachers called it the pearl of the Psalms. But if I was to guess, <clears throat> if we went around the room and said, Where, what, what do you think of when you think of Psalm 23? It's going to be that I've heard it at the graveside of a loved one, where it was read as a means to comfort me in my grief. And the question I want you to think about this morning as you come to this all-familiar psalm, and because it's familiar, it sort of comes with a context to you, is, is it only for the graveside, or is it for all of your life? The 23rd psalm here speaks to the intimate relationship between the Lord and his people, and it speaks to that in the language of a shepherd and a sheep and as a host and his guest. It conveys the personal care, the protection, the provision coming from the Lord directed towards the godly man. And it shows us God intimately knowing, lovingly caring, and providentially guiding his people. It communicates here to us the psalmist's joy. His joy is found in the Lord, is what we're going to see he completely and emphasize that completely relies upon him. And as a result of that, he finds comfort, rest, in everything that he could possibly need in this life and in the life to come. What he's showing us here is that the Lord completely cares for his people. He completely cares for his people's every need, and his people are perfectly satisfied with their shepherd. How can we say they're perfectly satisfied? Because he says it in the psalm in verse 1 that they lack nothing. Perfectly satisfied and content with their shepherd. Now, it comes in two metaphors, and I'll just give you these two sections here at the beginning. It's the loving shepherd in verses 1 through 4, and the gracious host in verses 5 through 6. We're going to spend far more time in the first part than the second part, so you can not be surprised. Look at the opening statement for the loving shepherd in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's work through that. Those words there, the Lord is my shepherd. 
But that's the word Yahweh. Yahweh is the shepherd here. He is identifying the holy God who created the heaven and the earth in Genesis 2, 4. He's identifying the God who formed man from dust in Genesis 2, 7. The God who showed favor to Noah and his family when he flooded the earth in Genesis 7. The God who made the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, who revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 3 as I am, who rescued Israel from Egypt, who led his people into the promised land, who promised to circumcise hearts, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, and who proclaimed, you'll remember this about himself, Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, and yet will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. That's who David calls shepherd. It's not the gods of Egypt that he calls shepherds, the shepherd. It's not the gods of the Philistines. 1 Samuel 19, 13, it's not even gods of his own wife, Michael. None of those were adequate. None of the inferior gods of the idolaters, would, it, would they be the one that David called my shepherd? And certainly, think about this and think about our day and age and think about just the pride of people. Here is the king of Israel calling him my shepherd. This is a man in our day and age, if he was in such a position, he might say, I'm shepherd of my own soul. I command the armies of Israel and the mighty men. I'm my own shepherd, but not this man. Only Yahweh is his shepherd. That word is, the Lord is my shepherd. Not that Yahweh was his shepherd and for some reason left him and ceased to be a shepherd or that one day he will be a shepherd, but right now, this very moment in which he lives, the holy and eternal God who created him is presently and continuously his shepherd, and he is a shepherd forever. <clears throat> the Lord is my, look at that word, my shepherd. Spurgeon said, this is the pearl of the Psalms. He said, this is the sweetest word in the entire Psalm, my. Spurgeon is the one who said, if he be a shepherd to no one else, he is a shepherd to me. He cares for me, watches over me, and preserves me. He's my shepherd. <clears throat> so with that word, this is deeply personal. What's, what's going on here? In that verse, in that word, Yahweh is not a shepherd. He's not the shepherd in some sense. He's not the shepherd of a corporate group of people, Israel, but it's personal. He's my shepherd, meaning I belong to him. I am his. He is mine. And my shepherd, the word shepherd there, this is what David is identifying Yahweh as being, his shepherd. Unlike other psalms, David is not identifying Yahweh here as his strength. That's Psalm 18.1, not his rock, Psalm 18.2, not his fortress, 18.2, not his deliverer or refuge or shield or horn of salvation or stronghold. He doesn't even say here, Yahweh is my hiding place. All of those he identifies God as in other places, and they all rightly have their own place and make their own point, but here Yahweh is my shepherd. He has a particular metaphor in mind to show you a particular truth about God. And keep in mind what you, I suspect you know. It's a shepherd who's identifying and calling Yahweh his shepherd because he knows something about what a shepherd does, what such a title conveys. My shepherd. A shepherd provides everything in the life of the sheep. They are there. They're present with the sheep day and night. They're with the sheep whether it's hot or cold, wet or dry, whatever the season is. They know the weaknesses of the sheep. They know the tendencies of the sheep. They're able to identify the health of the sheep. They know what's good for the sheep even when the sheep don't have an idea what's good for themselves. And they are always there guiding and protecting and providing and caring. So that, that word to call Yahweh shepherd is personal and intentional and intimate because the shepherd's ever near a sheep. Go back to what we said. This is him intimately knowing, his lovingly caring for, and is providentially guiding his sheep. That endearing title for the Lord Yahweh shows up throughout the Psalms. Psalm 28 verse 9 
Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. Psalm 77, 20, you led your people like a flock. Psalm 78, verse 52, he led forth his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them safely so that they did not fear. Throughout the Psalms, are you getting that? Not only are they saying Yahweh is the shepherd and he acts like a shepherd towards us, but that we're also sheep. Psalm 79, verse 13, so we, your people, and the sheep of your pasture will give thanks to you forever. So watch what's going on here. That's the picture, the proclamation. The Lord is my shepherd. What's the response of the sheep? The the outcome here of the Lord being their shepherd is that those who recognize themselves as his sheep, what do they say? Well, what David says, I shall not want... The word want there is a translation of the word meaning to lack. And the idea is not so much about not wanting something as it is sheep expressing that you lack nothing. All needs that I have is the sheep of my shepherd have been met. The Lord is my shepherd, I'm not in need. The Lord is my shepherd, I'm not deficient. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Why? What's the reason? The Lord is my shepherd. That's a striking statement for one to make who thinks of himself as a sheep. That's a striking statement for a shepherd to make because the shepherd knows what sheep are like. Sheep lack everything. A sheep wouldn't say that. It's hard for them to rest. It's hard for them to find places to eat unless it's just they're set there and it's provided for them. They lack direction, where to go. They're vulnerable to predators. They have no natural defenses. And they have some sense of all of that so that there's no comfort for sheep without a shepherd. But this sheep in the psalm says, I lack nothing. How can a sheep say that? What's going on in verse 1? The godly man here is recognizing that his shepherd has and will provide everything he could possibly need. He's confident of his shepherd's intimate knowledge of what he needs and his shepherd's loving care that's motivating him providing that need and his shepherd's ability to meet that need that he is actually able to do what he says that he's actually able to do. So all of his needs are met. This is David who's going to say then the same similar in verse chapter 37 or Psalm 37 verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And and what's coming out from this psalm is that the greatest desire that he has has been met because Yahweh is a shepherd and he knows what Yahweh can do. 37 verse 5, he says this, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, he will do it. Follow this shepherd. Now, how can he say, I shall not want? I ever need met? Well, he tells you. What does this man know about his shepherd to have such a confidence in him? Well, this is what you find in verses 1 through 4, six benefits that he identifies that the shepherd has provided, revealing what we're looking at, his intimate knowledge, his loving care, his providential guidance of his sheep. Six benefits. And the first is this. The shepherd provides rest. In verse 2, the shepherd provides rest. He makes me lie down in green pastures. One commentator who so happened to have also been a shepherd at one point in his life notes this. Sheep do not lie down easily. It is almost impossible for them to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. One, they have to be free of fear. Two, they have to be free from friction with others. That's relationships. Three, free of flies and other parasites. That's distractions. Four, free of feeling as though they are in need of food. As a result, What do you have with sheep? They seem to stay in this constant frenzy that's preventing them from lying down. Literally, the word here is stretching out. You're you're making yourself vulnerable, you've laid down. And you've prevented from doing that because the worries of the world and the frustrations of the world have robbed you of rest. Does that not sound familiar to you? 
If a shepherd is just this wonderful metaphor to be able to identify something for us about God in this text, how appropriate is frantic sheep for people? What's keeping you from rest? What's keeping you up at night? Is it fear of death or fear of failure or fear of other men or fear of what the future may hold? Is it laying in bed going, I hear my kid coughing in the other room. Oh no, are they going to be sick? Is it Is that sickness that has ravaged through our house and worn every one of us out in our house coming back again? Do you lie awake at night like thinking about relationships that are not as they should be? Are you kept from rest by how you're going to deal with other people? What keeps you from rest? Think think just about the world in which we live in, uh, of the multiple false teachers that are teaching you you have to just keep working and working and working to earn your salvation, that you must embrace another gospel, that in that gospel there is no offer of rest at all. Consider how many false shepherds are out there. They're putting a burden on people that are saying, oh, well, you don't have enough faith. You need to go work harder for your faith. You haven't given enough. You haven't served enough. You haven't prayed enough. You haven't evangelized enough. You haven't sacrificed for missions enough. You haven't planted enough churches. Would you just simply note from the text what this godly man possesses and enjoys in that word, enjoys. David, who calls the Lord my shepherd, knows The Lord gives his sheep rest. These sheep are not lacking in rest. The shepherd who is in control, sovereign, possesses the ability to meet every need, being perfectly divine, he knows every need beyond whatever you even think that you know is a need. There are needs you can't even recognize. He knows them. Because Yahweh is your shepherd and in complete control of your life, sheep, you can finally rest. This is the outcome of the doctrine of sovereignty and of providence, all resulting in rest. There's no way you could rest if God's not sovereign. You should lie awake trying to figure out what you can do to be in control to accomplish all the things you're trying to accomplish and save yourself But the sovereignty of the shepherd results in the rest of his sheep. The sovereignty of the shepherd results in the rest of his sheep. And beyond even that, you can even rest when others couldn't even possibly imagine resting. You can rest even when you've prayed for those that you desperately want to come to saving faith and they've yet to believe. And you can rest even when you've received a diagnosis that you didn't see coming. And you can rest even when there's a great big hole in your world because one who is so very dear to you has gone on to be with the Lord. And you can rest even when you have no idea what it is that tomorrow is going to bring with it. Even then, the Lord who is my shepherd can cause me to lie down. Listen, Ezekiel 34, verse 15. Rest is found when the Lord says there, I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest. And and I hope there's connections being made for you with your shepherd who you'll remember in Matthew 11, 28 says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You need a shepherd who can cause you to rest. A shepherd in whom you have confidence that he knows your name, he knows your situation, he knows your circumstances, and he is a shepherd who is sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, complete control. So the first benefit you can see is genuine rest is found in the shepherd. No other shepherd, but only in him who makes you to lie down. Sheep ought not be lacking rest. This is the shepherd that provides rest. Number two, the shepherd provides nourishment. The shepherd provides nourishment. Look at verse two. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. So this is a no-brainer. Sheep need to eat, and sheep need to drink, and guess who takes them there? There are times in Israel where in winter and spring, rains come, and this desert environment becomes lush in places with grass. 
Again, flying to California, you can see something about that right now because as you've heard, there's all of these rains that have taken place. And as you're coming in at this place that normally looks just brown and barren as lush and green because it's rained. And, and these are the places where sheep would need to be moved to in order to lay down and have grass all around them to eat. Then they wouldn't have to be moving at great distances. But then there's other times in these same regions where rains come and river, riverbeds that are long, dusty, and dry, they turn into dangerous, rushing waters, threatening to wash everything away that comes near them. But the psalmist says, Yahweh leads me, he guides his sheep, bringing them to quiet waters where they can drink without fear. How is that possible? Well, this shepherd knows where the green pastures are found. Because he's the one who caused the rain to fall there. And he knows where the quiet waters are because he's the one that made the channels where they reside there. Think about Job. Job 38, verse 25. He asks Job, who's cleft a channel for the flood or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people, on a desert without a man in it, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the seeds of grass to sprout? Oh, Job, can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightning that they may go and say, here we are? And then he asks, who can tip the water jars of the heavens? No other shepherd like Yahweh. No shepherd like this shepherd. The psalmist is proclaiming the truth here that the Lord is the shepherd who is truly capable of nourishing his sheep providing what a sheep need to sustain themselves and, and to be able to grow. And he, he gives them food and he gives them living waters. Is it really surprising then that when Jesus arrives on the scene, this is the way he's speaking, John 4, 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. He says in John 7, 37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and, and drink. He says in John 6, 35, I am, ego e me, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. What does that sound like? That if you come to Jesus, all oh, you can say, I lack nothing. He makes you to rest. Psalm 23, and to rest where food and water are plentiful. Why would he do that? Because he knows his sheep. He knows they need green pastures. He knows they need quiet waters. And what does this show? He is compassionate. He cares for his sheep. He truly cares for his sheep. What do the false shepherds do? Ezekiel tells you that. Ezekiel 34 verse 3, they slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, he says, you've not strengthened. The disease, you've not healed. The broken, you've not bound up. The scattered, you've not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you've dominated them. I suspect in their mind they didn't even know that they were being dominated by the false shepherds. And yet they kept going back to the false shepherds. And the false shepherds kept consuming them. Psalm 23 is so different. This shepherd's love and care for the sheep is evident by the way he nourishes the sheep and no one can nourish them like Yahweh because only Yahweh can nourish the soul. So a sheep ought not be without rest. Sheep ought not be malnourished. Yahweh's sheep are not lacking green pastures, quiet waters. Number three, the shepherd provides renewal. Renewal. Verse three, he restores my soul. One Hebrew scholar addresses the definition of restores by saying this, because there's back and forth on what the definition of restoring is addressing. He says, this phraseology in the Old Testament can refer to repentance and conversion or to relief and refreshment. So repentance and conversion or relief and refreshment. We know this shepherd provides both. He provides both repentance and conversion and relief and refreshment. So the idea that's being expressed here is new life, either in terms of repentance and conversion or revitalized life in terms of relief having come so that you're refreshed, either conveys that this shepherd is renewing his sheep. Again, what's that? The shepherd intimately knows you. He knows that you need refreshment because of your situation circumstances. 
And in his knowing, his ability to know his sheep by name is critical. He knows when they need their strength to be restored. He's capable of restoring their soul. What other shepherd could possibly do that? And he's motivated, once again, by love and compassion to do it. Even his word is such that he uses it to revive and refresh souls. Psalm 19, verse 7, he gives us his word. It does this, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. It's why you need to constantly be in the word. This shepherd lovingly revives his sheep. Why? Because he cares for them. When the shepherd comes, do you see him doing that? Remember Mark 6, verse 30, after the 12 were sent out, we read, the apostles gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while, for there were many people coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. Jesus knew his sheep that were so very near this group of men and said, they need relief. They need refreshment. And then what's he doing in that verse? He's tending the flock and he's leading them so that their soul may be restored. Christian, do you look to your shepherd to restore your soul? Is that who you're looking for to revive your soul? Or do you look to frivolous hobbies hobbies and activities and amusements, anything to distract you, that that's what you think would restore you? David knows his shepherd is the one who restores his soul. So watch, he provides rest, nourishment, renewal. Number four, the shepherd provides direction. The shepherd provides direction. Verse three, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Guess what? Sheep have another need that's being addressed here. Sheep need direction. The shepherd lovingly provides direction. We've already seen it. He's leading them to quiet waters, but here he's guiding them in the paths of righteousness. This is the right way for the sheep to go, the way that the sheep are not going to find apart from the shepherd guiding, that is leading, that is turning them in the direction in which they should go. And where is he guiding them? He's guiding them here on the paths of righteousness. That word path is the same word that you would see used for a wagon rut or for a trench. So what's going on here is that this would be the beaten out path in which the shepherd has long led his sheep in the way of righteousness. This is the right way in which they should go. This is the way of wisdom, the upright path of Proverbs 4. This is the way in which he teaches you to walk, Psalm 143. This is the way of righteousness in the midst of the path of justice, Proverbs 8. So his sheep can then profess and proclaim, I lack nothing. I like not direction, for he guides me in the paths of righteousness because he's given me his word, he's filled me with his spirit, and I'm following my shepherd who has called me to take up my cross and to follow him. David says, Psalm 31, verse 3, for your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. Psalm 23, 3, he's saying something much like that. The reason he guides his sheep is in the text for his name's sake. Why does he guide you into paths of righteousness, sheep? It's to honor his name, to glorify his name. This is good for you, is it not? Absolutely it's good for you to walk in the path of righteousness, to go in the right way, but more so it's for his glory. I was thinking about that, and it made me think of the book of Ezekiel once again, where the Lord is telling us what he's going to do all throughout the book of Ezekiel. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Why is he going to do it? You get the phrase at the end of each of those sections, so that then they will know that I am Yahweh. This is for my glory. Psalm 23, these are his sheep. How he leads them speaks to who the shepherd is. It speaks to him knowing, loving, providentially guiding, sovereignly caring, all proclaiming, this shepherd is great. There's no shepherd greater than him. He is unlike any other shepherd. All the others are inferior. This is about his glory. That the glory of the shepherd would be on brilliant display in the way in which he leads his sheep. What's our response? One scholar noted the sheep's response is this, that we would profess, Lord, use me for your name's sake. Lord, make me holy for your name's sake. 
<clears throat> Lord, keep me from evil for your name's sake. Lord, make me like you for your name's sake. Lord, lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. So that those who are not the sheep of this shepherd may look at you following your shepherd who he has put on this path and that they would be able to look at you and they would be able to know, oh, your shepherd, the Lord Yahweh, he is God. He provides rest, nourishment, renewal, direction. Number five, he provides protection. Verse four, protection. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Sheep are vulnerable when they are scattered and when they're left without a shepherd. But this sheep knows he's not alone. He's never been alone. He's never lacking. The shepherd's always there watching over him. Anywhere he goes, shepherd's there, especially where he goes in verse 4. This is sobering. The psalm is clear. The sheep walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Death is like a shadow here. Paths for sheep would lead them into valleys where cliffs would rise on both sides of them, and the dangers from boulders above and robbers and wild beasts ahead and below seemed always present in the canyon where the walls there would obstruct the sun from coming down. And sheep may go, what in the world am I doing here in such a place like this? Why has he brought me here? But remember, he has brought you here. He is the one guiding you on the paths of righteousness, and sometimes the paths of righteousness bring you into the valley of the shadow of death. The question is, do you trust your shepherd? James Montgomery Boyce said, it is important to note that the valley of the shadow of death is as much God's right path for us as the green pastures which lie beside quiet waters. A knowing, loving, compassionate God has brought you here, and even when you're here, you're not alone. What does he say? I fear no evil, for you are with me. What a striking statement for a sheep to make. I fear not. Christian, you can walk in the path without fear because your shepherd's with you. Without fear, wherever that path is going to lead you. Some of you heard Piper cite this the other night, and I was trying to figure out where he got it from. I've heard Bunyan, I've heard Whitfield, I've heard Wesley, maybe one of you know that old quote, I am immortal until my work is done. One day the path that he has you on is going to take you out of this world, yes, but until that day you are immortal. Why are you immortal? Not because you're like one of the action figures you see on a, on a Marvel movie. Not, not at all. Not because you're some all-powerful, undefeatable creature, but because you have an all-powerful God that's watching over you. And your life on this earth doesn't conclude until the day he says it concludes. What does that look like? I told you we met with various missionaries during the week. But on Friday at lunch, I was invited to be in a small room with 20 other pastors just cram-packed in there. It was like riding on a small airplane. There's a Pakistani pastor who's standing before us who's wanted to grow as a preacher and as a teacher and saying he desperately needs resources, but he's going into all of these sorts of places and he believed without a doubt, he was convicted that the Lord had called him to go into the Taliban village. And everybody around him said, the only thing you're going to come out with is a bullet in your head. But he was convinced this is the path. Here the... the Shadow of death was real. He goes into the village. He's met with the village leader who shows up with two rifles wrapped around him. And he says, what are you doing here? Where are you from? And all he could think of to say was, I'm from the church. Church is here. And the guy from the Taliban says, oh, I like the church. He said, 10 years ago, there was an earthquake in this village, and many people were hurt. And he said, these doctors and nurses came in, and they're helping us. And we said, where are you from? And they said, we're from the church. And all these years later, that's resonating in his mind, and he welcomes him into the village. He distributes these Christmas gifts to everyone, and he says, these are just a symbol of the greatest gift that God has given us in his son. He preaches the gospel to the Taliban. The valley of the shadow of death is real. 
But we need not fear. Our shepherd is watching over us. Christian, did you know he says, your shepherd says, that he is with you? Some of those final words from Jesus there, Matthew 28. We always think of this as, in terms of great commission going out, but remember what he says, the whole of it. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The absence of fear is because of the presence of the shepherd. You do not lack his protection and his oversight. Isn't that almost comical to think about this? Fearless sheep? That, that's ridiculous sounding. But it's a reminder of who your shepherd is and his presence that makes fearless sheep a reality. Because as faith in the shepherd grows, fear and everything else recedes. As faith in the shepherd grows, fear and everything else subsides. He provides rest, nourishment, renewal, direction, protection, comfort. He provides comfort, verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The shepherd's rod was an oak club that was two feet long, used to defend sheep against threats. He possessed the tool to protect the sheep, to fight off beasts that wanted to consume them. The staff, on the other hand, was an instrument used for the sheep with the hook at the end that you're familiar with. They could push brush aside, pull out sheep from the thicket, or correct sheep as they're going astray and direct sheep on the proper way. Rod and staff, this picture of a staff, all throughout Scripture there are these wonderful objects that convey these truths about God. The shepherd's crook comes along here in Psalm 20 and it takes its place amongst them. The servant has a cross. The sovereign has a crown. The shepherd has a staff. Do you know the comfort of the shepherd's staff? Do you know the joy and the contentment and the security that the shepherd's staff brings? It brings it to David. Or when you think about that staff moving brush aside, pulling you out, sending you on the proper way, does that frustrate you instead? Do you view it as an obstacle, an instrument robbing you of what you desire? Friend, it's his staff that's a reason that the sheep can say, I lack nothing. Friend, how you view the shepherd's staff says something about your heart and your relationship to the shepherd. David says it's a comfort. It's a comfort because it guides me to green pastures, to quiet waters, along the paths of righteousness, through the valley of the shadow of death, away from what's deadly, away from what's destructive, and ultimately it leads him home. That's our second metaphor, the gracious host, verses 5 and 6. Watch how it changes. The godly man, David, is now an honored guest in the house of the Lord. Note those last two verses. You... He's talking to Yahweh, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where has he led him to? His house. The path has brought him to the place where Yahweh dwells. And the godly man here has come to be an honored guest in Yahweh's house. The Lord who is here is gracious and he's this welcoming host. So way more brief than we walked through verses 1 through 4. What do you see the shepherd providing here in these final two verses where he comes to dwell? Well, you see in verse 5 rest and nourishment, right? The table is prepared. You see compassion and favor in verse 5. The enemies are watching. They know that there's a distinction between them and the, the one who is a, uh, is, is a visitor here. And, and it's on his head, David's head, that the Lord has poured an abundance of oil, showing his great favor. This, this practice that would have occurred whenever someone came into your house and you wanted to show that they were welcome there to pour oil on their head, it's, it's his head that oil is poured upon, not theirs. There's an abundance, verse 5. He's given way more than his cup is able to hold. That there is love that's on display. The Lord's compassion is on display here. Literally, goodness and has said, loving kindness will pursue me, is what he's saying. He's part of a family. Look at that, verse 6, he lives in this house forever. 
That intimate relationship is expressed in the guest being graciously welcomed here, and he's not anticipating going home, but this is where he lives. He comes as a guest, and he stays forever. You see the Lord intimately knowing, lovingly caring, providentially providing everything his people need and more in doing it forever. What's our response? I think it goes back to verse 1. From our mouth we'd be able to say, I lack nothing. I lack nothing. Can you say that? Do you say that? Will you be able to say that in eternity? Or will you lack everything? There is a shepherd who is the Lord God who will lead you to his house where you, his invited guest, will dwell with him forever and forever confess, verse 1, I shall lack nothing, I lack nothing. Why? Because everything I have is here. Everything I need is here because here's where my shepherd is. My shepherd who has always been there, who has never left me, is with me in eternity. So we go back to where we started. The Lord completely cares for his people, and his people are perfectly satisfied, lacking nothing with their shepherd forever. I think the psalm points us to how we get there. How do we get to that spot? How does he shepherd us to dwell with him forever? And that's where the psalm offers more showing us that God is compassionate, providential, all-knowing, all-powerful, but more, this is where the psalm points to salvation in Christ. The psalm gives us even more than the intimate relationship between God and His people where He shows us that He cares for us and He lays this path for the coming shepherd is where he is going here to show us how this relationship is forged. It's years after the psalm is written that Isaiah 40 starts with these words. Isaiah 40. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. The question you have then is, okay, well, how are you going to comfort your people? With this, Isaiah 40, verse 10, Behold, the Lord will come with might and with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock in his arm and he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. What's the promise? Lord's coming and he's going to tend his flock. You get to Ezekiel. And I read to you the prophecies about the shepherds who are not God, who are devastating the flock. The flock is scattered for lack of a shepherd. They've become food for every beast of the field. That's verse 5. What does the Lord God, intimately knowing, lovingly caring, and providentially guiding, what does he promise to his sheep? Verse 11. Behold, I myself will search for my sheep. My shepherd, the Lord calling them my sheep, and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep. I will feed them in a good pasture. There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will lead them to rest. Who's the shepherd? Yahweh's the shepherd. He's saying that. But watch, what does he say in verse 23 if you're in Ezekiel 34? Then he says, I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince amongst them. I, the Lord, have spoken. David's coming back? David's been dead for years at that point. We know he's directing us to the coming son of David, the Messiah, the shoot that springs from the stem of Jesse, the branch from his root, Isaiah 11, who he spoke about in another shepherd passage, Jeremiah 23, verses 3 through 6. Listen, then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them. They will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor be any missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. There's David again. 
What will he do? He will reign as king, act wisely, do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will be secure. And this is the name by which he will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. He uses the name of Yahweh, our righteousness, Jeremiah 23, 6. A shepherd who provides everything you need because he provides the righteousness you desperately need. When the shepherd's born, what's the name he's given? Told it in Isaiah 7, comes up in Matthew 1, 23, Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then what does God with us say in John 11, 10, 11? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. More to come on John 10 next time. What's your takeaway from Psalm 23? You lack nothing. You're satisfied in your shepherd. You can be sure that your shepherd knows you. He knows your needs. He knows the dangers that surround you. You can be sure that the shepherd cares for you, the shepherd loves you, that your shepherd is in total control. So the godly man who lives in view of Psalm 23 is able to express, I lack nothing. I do not fear the shadow of death. I do not fear the arrival of death. I will not be consumed with the worries of this world. I will not act as though I live without a shepherd. What does that mean? That means, oh, I can go into surgery and not know exactly how that's going to turn out, but I do know one thing for sure. I know my shepherd comforts me. I can be diagnosed with something that feels like I've run into a brick wall and it's causing me uncertainty about the future because I never saw this coming, but I have absolute certainty in this. I know my shepherd has guided me here and he's going to guide me all the way through. And I can be called to care for a loved one whose health is deteriorating before my eyes. And together we thought our later years would look nothing like this. But what I thought and what I know were absolutely different. And although it seems lonely, I know my shepherd is with me even here. And I'm not alone and his staff is guiding me. And I know, I know that one day when my work is complete, my path on this earth has come to an end. My shepherd is there with me. My shepherd who has loved me and cared for me and provided for me in this life so that I can say, I lack nothing. Christian, he will lead you safely to the golden shore. He who you have called my shepherd who guided you all throughout this life will not leave you then. No, he will now be guiding you through death along the path, taking you to Zion City where we sing, where beside the king I walk, for there my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. So following him there through death, him who you call my shepherd, all of those watching, and there will be those that are watching, must confess this is some great shepherd. This is some glorious God that you're following. Following through suffering, following up to death, following all the way through death. They will know he is Yahweh. and He is glorious and he is great. Who else can do what the shepherd, what the psalmist says that the shepherd is capable of doing here? Nobody. You have nobody else but Christ your shepherd who is God. If you are apart from him, you are a sheep without a shepherd, and you are on dangerous ground, and you lack everything. You are alone, you are vulnerable, you are malnourished, you are far from home, you are on a deadly path. What's the call to you this morning if you don't believe? Call to Psalm 37, what we read how David's talking about the shepherd once again. Commit your way to him. Trust him. Cry out for your shepherd to save you. And Christian, take what you have here in Psalm 23. Direct people, direct lost people to your shepherd. And remind people in encouraging other Christians. Remind them of what is theirs in their shepherd. Remind them of all that your shepherd provides. 
And you, Christian, trust your shepherd. And you, Christian, remember he is there. And you, Christian, remember he is compassionate and he cares and he loves you and he has provided everything for you so that you can say, I lack nothing. If he be a shepherd to no one else, oh, he is a shepherd to me. He cares for me, watches over me, preserves me. May our lives confess the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Father, thank you for your word And thank you for the good testimony of David filled with the Spirit speaking here of you, of caring for him, loving him, meeting every need. I pray that Psalm 23 would be applied to our mind, applied to our heart, and applied to our soul. And I pray that the lost that are here amongst us this morning, oh, Father Shepherd, would you give them life. Would you give them life? Would you take them off the path of death and destruction? Or would you put them on the path of life and righteousness? Would you give them life? Father, I pray that you would take Psalm 23 and that you would encourage sheep that are suffering and sheep that are weary and sheep that need to be refreshed and that you would refresh them. I pray that you would remind us of everything that we have in you. And that, Father, we would be filled to the full and that our lives would say we are following a great and mighty God. And that people in a watching world would look at us and they would say this God must be great. All to the glory of your name. Amen.